Good afternoon to all of our attendees and our panelists. Welcome to the TNT IFC's third edition of our webinar series entitled Making TNT a Fintech Enabled Financial Services Hub. I am Rudolf Hanamji, the Manager for Marketing and Communications here at the TNT IFC, and I will be your host this afternoon. We're very happy that you've decided to join us as we are going to explore the potential benefits of fintech in Trinidad and Tobago. Allow me to acknowledge our panelists. We have with us this afternoon our very own chairman, Mr. Richard P. Young, a chartered accountant by qualification. His career comprises the highest leadership levels in accounting, auditing, insurance, and banking. And he has worked, of course, in the regional financial services sector for over 40 years, with many of you recalling his his experience as the managing director of Scotiabank Trinidad and Tobago Limited. And before he retired in 2012, he served as the senior vice president of the Bank of Nova Scotia. Mr. Young has served on the council of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Trinidad and Tobago and was its president. He has also in the past been a director of the Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange and served as its chairman and was also the president of the Bankers Association of Trinidad and Tobago for three terms. Our CEO, Mr. Omar Sultan Khan, brings to the Trinidad and Tobago IFC an outstanding track record of over a decade of local, regional, and international experience in the financial services sector. His career with domestic and multinational agencies has spanned varied portfolios, having involved relationship management, capital markets, credit risk analysis, business development, and of course, public-private partnerships and negotiations. Our Vice President for Financial Markets Development, Mr. Chandradath Maraj, recently joined the TNT IFC and brings with him over 12 years of senior management and leadership experience in a wide range of industries, both locally and internationally, including the United Kingdom, the United States and Central America. He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience in the areas of finance and accounting, financial management, business process re-engineering, regulations, regulatory policy development, and of course, financial services sector development. So I welcome our panelists and all of you to our third edition this afternoon. As you are aware, for those who have been following, the webinar series is but one component in our ongoing stakeholder outreach initiatives, which seek to really position the country, both domestically and internationally, as the premier location in the Caribbean and Latin America for financial services. It is our hope that series such as these will drive awareness, understanding, and adoption of fintech and really the entire vision of making Trinidad and Tobago a cashless society. All of this will redound to investment in the country's financial services sector and the creation of sustainable jobs and of course foreign direct investment and foreign exchange revenues. So in keeping with our vision and mission this afternoon, we really wanna take you through the process by which we can all help to create a new and more resilient economy. Uh, there's been a lot of disruption, of course, in the market, and the government has laid out its development plan for the country, and we also have a national recovery effort underway in light of COVID-19. So today, our agenda will take us through, starting off with our chairman, the idea of where does the TNT IFC's work fit into the policy perspective for creating a digitalized nation. And our CEO will walk us through the benefits at both the national level as well as a consumer and business point of view level. And then Chan will carry us through a few of the challenges which we are all aware of, but give you some nuance to those challenges. But more importantly, focus in on some of the critical success factors that are required to help us overcome those challenges and achieve these mandates. So without further ado, I would love to hand you over to Mr. Young, who will, as I said, take you through the idea of policy and how it can drive this fintech integration agenda. Mr. Young. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you very much, Rudy. It's great to be here. 
Um, it's amazing how the world has changed, eh? that we now do things that we using a lot of technology. But again, as Rudy says, just to give a perspective, if you could give me the next slide, please. I think it's important for us to understand that we are still perhaps one of the larger, or if not the largest, financial sector in the English Caribbean, English-speaking Caribbean. And, and, and the truth is, the stats are there, it shows you the significant um, size of its, of its assets, and then, of course, the fact that it contributes at least 7% of our GDP. And, and one of the things, though, historically, is that as a country, we tend to be as people, as a people, I should say, we tend to be very risk adverse, and we take a, we take a conservative approach. And that has held us in good stead, because we didn't get ourselves all caught up in the 2008 fiasco, and even one of our close um, brothers in, in Jamaica, you know, with their whole financial debacle. And um, so we have remained, I think, fundamentally, a, a, a you know, a good financial cent um, center and a hub for the region. But of course, global sport, sport industrial resolution is now on us, and we really have to do something. And I think that we must begin to transform the country, and that's where more recently has been reinforced by the policymakers in terms of digitiz digitalization. We will digitize, and then the whole art of doing that is digitalization. So, you know, we are here to be part of that and certainly banking and insurance industry, which is integral, as I mentioned earlier, and we are all part of that. Next. So what we have to do really as, as, as a country is to continue economic growth and to, of course, stimulate it. And in, in a sense, everybody knows um, COVID has really brought some of that and speeded it up. And, and, and in a sense, that's one of the positives of, of, of the pandemic, that it has caused us to sit back. And, and now we as a country, certainly stated by the government, that we've got to really now move this country forward. And a committee was appointed, the, the roadmap to recovery. And just for the benefit of people, the roadmap to recovery is really into three parts, three sort of phases. And um, I don't want to repeat it, but it's there to survive, then to reignite, and of course to transform. And, and that's, that's the critical part. So the next slide. So it is important for us to really understand that to really, that digital transformation does in fact help an economy recover. And it becomes fundamentally a pillar. And some of the things that we'll do, of course, is that in creating that enabling environment using technology, um, that helps. And then, of course, increasing the access to services, digital services, that is. Then you will build out of the infrastructure. And not most importantly, of course, is the legislation that will sort of, I guess, ensure that it's properly done and then the policy that will guide it. And then, of course, it ties in with the whole recent pandemic in terms of, you know, it, it facilitates a lot of working from remote locations. But most critical, of course, is the digitalization of the government services. And that's where financial services will have a role to play. Because when you digitize something and you bring about digitalization, at the end of the day with government services, some form of payment is required. And they talk about you know having an electronic um, ID and, and stuff like that. So that's the sort of background with it, you know to, to drive this policy. Next, and then I think you know just to ensure that that you know we play our part, the CPIFC in the Vision 2030 statement, it talks about the mandate that every every um, ministry or department should play a role in in sort of looking at how we do things and trying to improve it. And we at the CTIFC want to remain committed. We want to ensure that we facilitate the collaboration between private and public sectors with all the key players in the financial services arena, help of course and enable the government policy. And as we said at the start, one of the sort of byproducts of all this is the sort of diversification of our economy 
in the sense of building a digitized financial services sector. And that brings about a different type of skill, you know, different way of doing things. You know, the, the, the younger people of your see more aligned and, and they themselves will play a role in building the sector. And that's where we see the CKIFC again, as we say they're being a resourceful ally to help bring this all about, as, as a, we are the, the sort of enabler to achieve this as it relates to the financing of the sector. Okay, so I would like to, to, to leave that with you and, and then pass, pass back to, to Rudy. Thank you very much, Chairman. I think the fourth industrial revolution is a, is a point that definitely cannot be taken for granted. And thank you for reinforcing the, the, the fact that Trinidad and Tobago has always had a thriving financial services sector. And it's really how do we build on that using the technology and using the intellectual property and the human capital that is available to us to build centers of excellence and further competitiveness and where does, does that really fit into government policy over the next five years. So thank you very much for sharing those points. But what policy is important and it is the implementation sometimes of policy that commentators and you know, policy makers and people at the operational level at times have a challenge with and I think it's important, therefore, for Omar to now take us through why focused delivery and the necessary resource allocations to bring this policy to life are so critical in this area. Because if we can do that effectively, the country can then benefit greatly from this type of engagement. So Omar, I would like to invite you to take our audience through some of these potential benefits that would incentivize us to get behind the policy that the chairman shared with us. Well, thank you very much, uh, Rudolph, and good afternoon to all the participants on the various um, media outlets. Um, you know, we, we touched upon it, uh, chairman may have touched upon it, but you know, I take this opportunity to give us some context as well. Um, you know, we've indicated that the role of the Trinidad Tobago IFC has evolved. And this evolution is really based on, on two, two main areas. One was just observing the trends in the market and feedback from conferences and potential investors that we've had along the way. And the other was just a constant reflection on how the IFC can best fulfill its mandate. So in recognizing the enormous uh, and potential benefits that come with FinTech, uh, the Trinidad Tobago IFC would have embarked upon uh, feasibility study in 2018 with EY, which really was about stakeholder engagement, taking a look at what's happening globally, the global trends, what's happening regionally among some of our competitive competitors in the islands, and then what's happening here in Toronto and Tobago. What, what are some of the foundational elements that we have here? And really it was looking at to see what niche areas can we focus on within the Toronto and Tobago financial sector, target for growth through the adoption of FinTech. Our first step out of this roadmap was to present it to the Ministry of Finance. We would have had a, a, a two to three year plan that we would have outlined, presented it to the Ministry of Finance in May 2019, and given the, the, the green light to go ahead to pursue some of the initiatives that we would have outlined, really to, uh, on the path of becoming a cashless society. Our first step in this plan was the development of a fintech association. It really involved collaboration with a number of players in the market in both the public and private sector. And it was really about bringing them together these different sectors, financial services, technology, and any of these related sectors to work with government, with regulators to help shape the environment. We would, officially, would have officially launched FinTech TT, which is the FinTech Association of Trinidad and Tobago in February, 2020, earlier this year. And from that time, we've now been engaging in the interim for some public awareness campaigns through the TTIFC as well as FinTech TT. And it really has started to, to gain some, some momentum. We would have officially handed over FinTech TT to the private sector just last week. Um, so the board is, I mean, uh, consists of primarily private sector members. The Trinidad Tobago IFC will maintain a position on this board to ensure that there's always some balance between the public and private sector initiatives. But really, we understand that the, the, the goal, the, the power comes from the private sector in pushing these initiatives through. 
And now really it's, it's necessary for the partner with other private entities, but other public sector entities. You would see that we now have the digital transformation arm of the Ministry of Public Admin. And our, our goal now is really to avoid working in silos and collaborate on a way forward. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, please. So what are we really working towards? So what are the benefits of this national initiative? And there's a number of areas that we can focus on. Um, one thing to point out is that we do have a, a good foundation here in Trinidad Tobago from the infrastructure standpoint. You know, we, we always talk about our internet penetration and mobile usage, and a number of other areas that where citizens and private sector have implemented certain uh, key fundamentals that are required to move into a fintech enabled financial sector. But you know, at the top of the list is really unleashing innovation. And really what, what this means is that you know, the fintech ecosystem is it's critical to nurturing ideas and technological innovation. I'm speaking about different apps, mobile apps, it can be artificial intelligence, machine learning, perhaps digital currencies, blockchain. There's a lot of innovative ideas that have been proven elsewhere and something that could easily be introduced in Toronto and Tobago. But as most of this innovation will come from startup firms, so moving on to create enough startup tech firms. Um, there's a number of firms already in Trinidad and Tobago, operating locally and throughout the region. And these firms can expand their operations as, as throughout the region, not just within Trinidad and Tobago, because as many of you understand, you know, for fintechs to, to fully succeed and be as efficient as possible, you need the scale, you need the numbers of, of, of participants and consumers uh, to back it. So by creating a fintech enabled ecosystem, the country will become a fertile ground for new fintech startups as seen in fintech hubs around the world. And part of this with this uh, creation of uh, startups, excuse me, is creating a new entrepreneurial environment. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, it's, it's critical, financing is critical for entrepreneurship to blossom. You know, finance being the critical, one of the critical elements for entrepreneurship to blossom. And, you know, I, I'll refer to the, the global, the latest global competitive, this report from 2019, where Toronto Tobago scored relatively well for its overall financial system, 45th out of 141 countries. But we didn't uh, score in venture capital availability, uh, 110 and 119 respectively. So there's certainly room for progress to be made. And you know, just recently an example that I can give you uh, that some of you may have read in the, in, in the newspapers over the last week was a company to finance, finance SME TT, which would have uh, launched a digital platform to access finance and loans for SMEs. You know, this really is a, a sector of the market that falls outside of you know, the, the target markets for larger financial institutions and fintechs have a way of filling that gap and creating opportunities for entrepreneurship to succeed. So all in all, this really comes down to boosting the financial sector and it, it allows for increased access to finance, which creates a more vibrant financial sector, able to more formal and credit savings instruments and able financial systems to capture more savings and extend further credit, which overall would lead to greater confidence in the banking system. Uh, so I see you jumped across to, uh, to the next slide where we will touch upon some of the benefits now uh, for businesses and consumers. And really at the top of that list is convenience. Uh, if you can head back to the previous slide, please. Thank you. Right, so on the top of that list is convenience and speed. You know, the use of technology really is much more efficient and convenient for transactions, especially with mobile connectivity, consumers using their smartphones, their tablets, their laptops, whatever it may be. It just allows for quicker transactions uh, to, to occur and uh, to happen at any time and anywhere. So that's really the number one uh, key benefit that a number of persons would understand for FinTech for consumers. The other is cost reduction. Now, what do I mean by cost reduction? You know, naturally a lot of us would say, well, it's, it's free to, for me to use cash. You know, consumers think about that. Um, it doesn't cost them to use cash, but what you have to understand is for the government and for uh, business owners, there is a cost for using cash, uh, for holding cash, for transporting it um, and, and managing it. So what I mean by cost reduction is by companies moving to more digital platforms, digital options, for payment, not completely eliminating cash, but allowing for the other options, it allows them to save in certain areas which these cost savings can be passed on to the, the consumer. So there is, that's an idea where when we speak about cost reduction and, and FinTech, that's what we're really speaking about. And a, a statistic that uh, was out of one of the studies by A.T. Kearney and, and Visa stated that, you know, 
when companies switch to digital platforms, on average, they may save about two cents on every dollar, which when you add it up over time is, is a significant savings that would, would generally be passed on to the consumer. And then another area of, of benefit to the business and consumer is, is financial inclusion. And what I mean by that is access for the underserved as well as the usage. You know, in Toronto and Tobago, we have the majority of Christians who have access to financial services. We may not be unbanked, but to a certain extent underbanked, where we do have, for instance, a bank account um, that we've signed up from, from late teenage years. But the usage of these financial services is where we really need to, to really build upon and given the opportunity to the underserved to, to learn about different facilities that can be used and give them that ability to learn and educate themselves to further advance their financial services usage. And then finally, touching upon security, uh, I didn't mention it also for, from a society level, but FinTech offers the ability to be much more transparent, to track, to formalize for traceability of economic transactions, which in turn helps with you know, fighting crime, corruption, and also provides the ability to provide confirmation of payment for ease of doing business. A lot of this is, comes into the security aspects of FinTech, which are some of the benefits that have been proven, not just in some of the other markets uh, in the region, but a lot of the developed markets throughout the world. And really, as, as a private public sector entity, teaming up with private sectors along the way to bring these benefits to Toronto and Tobago is really where our focus should be in the next few years as we come out of this uh, pandemic and really try to build back the economy. Uh, so, you know, I really look forward to the panel discussion and the questions that the, the participants may have. And uh, back to you, Rudy. Thank you very much, Omar. I, you know, people sometimes talk about the challenges that we face, but from listening to the flow of work that you outlined, it is clear that the TNT IFC has been keep maintaining a pulse on what is happening in the global financial services ecosystem. And we are able to translate that into policy recommendations. And for those of you interested in joining or getting more information about FinTech TT, their website is very easy to find. It's fintechtt.com. And you can actually apply to be a member today. I think it's important that you outlined that there are benefits both at the national level from a country perspective, but then also at the micro level for a business, for especially in the MSME sector, and also at an individual consumer level, because I think in the day-to-day -day runnings, and we can get more into this in the discussion, as you said, the average man on the street probably thinks, well, digitalization isn't going to impact me just yet. That's something to come in the future but it is here and we are looking forward to really ensuring everyone understands and feels comfortable with the digitalization and fintech and Trinidad and Tobago moving towards being cashless so that they can in fact enjoy the benefits that you outlined. But as I mentioned in the introduction, there are some challenges that we will face and are facing as a nation while we remain inspired and motivated by all that is possible. And I'd like to ask Chan to walk us through some of those challenges. Uh, some of these we may take for granted, but sometimes it's, it's important to state the obvious and unpack it, but at the, and then at the same time, consider what are the critical success factors that we all need to be involved in to overcome those challenges and to, to achieve the success. So Chan, please share with our audience Thank you, Rudy. Um, next slide. So, of course, it's a privilege to be here um, to participate in this webinar with my colleagues and, of course, um, great work by the panelists so far. So, of course, you know, with everything that is new and everything that is different that comes into the environment, there are certain challenges that always crop up. One of the main ones, and of course, a critical one that is ever present is resistance to change. And this is something that has to be managed very, very you know, carefully in order for us to be able to overcome that hurdle. So when we talk, when we talk about uh, resistance to change, we speak about, for example, the financial sector. The financial sector typically has been very slow to adopt new technologies. 
Now, this can possibly be due to the fact that, you know, Trinidad and Tobago has a very large number of bank account holders. And as such, they may not see financial technology as a priority. Possibly it can also be, you know, financial sector, the financial sector currently, you know, they enjoy a level of comfort. And as such, moving away from that comfort zone can also bring a level of agitation. Now, another challenge is that consumers. Consumers generally tend to be resistant to change because as Shinbegonians, we love the look and the feel of money. Um, traditionally, we've been using cash. Um, persons keep cash in their homes, they keep it in a bank, they keep it all over. People like to work with cash. And cash generally brings a convenience as well. And it's very quick, it's very easy to use. The thing is, when COVID-19 hit, that forced persons and all parties to kind of really look at how they do business and how they look at how they can then do transactions generally. Another challenge that we look at and we face, of course, is lack of knowledge. FinTech, while it, hasn't been, it, it isn't something that is new, it has been around for a while, the knowledge and the understanding of it is very, very limited. So of course, as we all know, um, persons tend to be very wary of technology and persons tend you know, to have a concern about who has access to the information. What will happen to my data? Is it safe if I give it to you? And that is a concern that is always playing a person's mind. And of course, this comes from a lack of information and, and education about financial technology, about FinTech. This lack of education and information, it can lead to very low adoption rates. Of course, lack of education, what it also brings is a lack of clarity and certainty. And this lack of clarity and certainty, inevitably, it breeds distrust, it breeds fear. And this too can cause a level of resistance to change. And finally, when we look at uh, challenges, we tend to look at, especially in the area of FinTech, there tends to be a lack of agreement on how we move forward in pushing the FinTech agenda. There are varying agendas from different stakeholders throughout the country, and there tend to have been a lack of consensus of how best we can integrate financial technology in a way that offers the best benefits to everyone. Having said that though, very recently, there has been a convergence of the minds and of resources, and there's now a significant push for collaboration among all the relevant stakeholders. In particular, and you know, from a personal standpoint, the TTIFC has been doing just that. And now with FinTech TT, as mentioned by our CEO, we are driving you know, financial the financial technology agenda and collaborating with everyone and all stakeholders to ensure its success um, it's successful imp implementation and operation, and importantly, driving Trinidad and Tobago towards a cashless society. Next slide. Now, again, with everything that is new, you know, there are certain things that are critical for its success. So we look at the critical success factors. We have looked at all of the challenges, and of course, if we were to flip those challenges and treat with those challenges, it then becomes a critical success, a success factor. Now, one of the main ones and the first one is education and public adoption. The fact is citizens must have knowledge and they must understand the uses and the benefits of financial technology solutions. If there is to be any sort of widespread uh, adoption, there must be constant collaboration, constant public relation and commitment to information sharing to ensure that the public is always aware, not just with what is happening now, but what is to come and understanding of that as well. One of the concerns as well, especially when you speak about, uh, about uh, information technology, our bank accounts, when you speak about our money and where they're stored, cybersecurity and data protection is very important. Strong data protection, cybersecurity laws and infrastructure, they're all essential in creating and sustaining a safe environment for all stakeholders. Companies, they must work in the best interest of their consumers. They must protect the personal information of their consumers and ensure that they have a strong uh, security infrastructure to ensure that the system operates well. The e-money policy speaks directly to this. It speaks about the governance structure of, um, of, of fintech operators and of course, consumer protection all of which forms part of their risk management strategies in ensuring that data is protected. The cybersecurity 
is in place and the, the whole ecosystem is protected. Finally, from a cybersecurity and data protection standpoint, the regulators and the policy makers, they must continue to do their part to ensure that adequate regulatory framework uh, is available and so adoption of fintech will increase. Again, the e-money policy is an excellent start to this. Finally, when we look at success factors, effective change management is critical. And this starts with leadership. Leadership plays a critical role in change management. And as we can see, government policy is now geared towards dig digitalization. And this is evidenced by the discussion on fintech adoption by the government and the work that, is, that was completed by the joint regulators, the central bank, the TPIFC and the FIU in bringing out the e-money policy and the innovation hub to ensure that fintechs are regulated. And, that, um, and of course we know that we now have a, an expanded ministry of uh, public administration and digital transformation. All of this shows from a leadership standpoint the drive and the push towards digitalization. Similarly, from an effective change management standpoint, local businesses must adopt and embrace these technologies and provide these avenues for expanded payments and give the options to consumers. Consumers as well, they must be able to embrace a mindset that embraces this technology, embraces this innovation, instead of being intimidated by it. The fact is, change is here, it will occur, but that process and that change, it isn't overnight. It's a process, it's a journey, and it will take time. And we all have a place and we all have a role in this. And we will get there if we start today, if we start here, and if we start now. Thank you, back to you, Rudy. Thank you very much, Chan. Education, data protection, change management. I think that these, of course, as you said, parts of these issues are not going to be implemented overnight and they can't be either because enough there needs to be necessary thought and and processes and put in place to ensure protection of the consumer at the end of the day so ladies and gentlemen you've heard some of the introductory remarks from our panelists and they've set a tone for what i hope to be a very engaging discussion in the next few minutes that are left on the webinar i want to remind everyone who's listening in that you can send your questions and comments through on the panel uh, for the panel sorry using the q and a module on zoom for those of you who are on Facebook Live, you may also post your comments there. If we don't get to all of them today, we will consider them and be in touch uh, and also bear them in mind with our future communications. But let's start with this issue of culture change because all of you touched on the fact that it is important to get the citizen to get the human being behind this because the technology obviously exists. And perhaps I could start with Chairman because I know you've shared with us in the past uh, one of the projects that you would have overseen while you were at Scotiabank, which was, of course, the integration of the ATMs throughout Trinidad and Tobago. Maybe you could share some anecdotes from that experience or just your, your general perspective on how do you go about getting a customer an end user of a bank or any other financial service who is so accustomed and they have habits how do you go about getting them on board and, and changing their mindset that's that's a <laughs> a really tough tough question really because you know just 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 as an aside i was looking at chan's slide and he said, out with the old, in with the new. I think the next time he's going to say, out with the old, in with young. <laughs> um, you know, when, when many, many years ago, when the banking sector first introduced the ATM, the big challenge, our channel was saying, is to get people to change their habits, to, to line up, for, you know, rather than going to the branch, which, of course, for many people, Certainly, old fogies like me now as a retiree is a good social interaction. But of course, COVID has now brought this, this difference. But you know, the, the question of using ATMs is not an easy one. Um, they had issues in terms of like 
payment for bills or even depositing cash. That was the big issue. You know, can I afford to put cash in and then find that I don't get credit? Or in fact, if you're paying a bill, you know, we have this tradition that in case the people come to cut us off, so to speak, the utilities companies, they wanted a stamp. A bank teller stamp, which anybody could get, but still, you know, it, 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 so it's, a, it's really a change thing. And then, of course, when we brought in online banking, it was also another thing. I think the important thing is that when people begin to see convenience, and today, of course, time is crucial. Traveling is crucial. COVID again has reinforced that how much more productive we'll become as a country when we're working from home and we don't have to spend hour and a half, two hours a day commuting. And when you transact technology while using digital, it, it makes it easier. And, and of course, Omar also mentioned the cost factor. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a change thing. That's, that's what it is fundamentally. And it is really getting people comfortable. Uh, you know, and I give this story years ago when I was in Toronto, I saw this old lady in a shopping mall, elderly lady, I should say, using an ATM. She was about 70 plus or 80. Then I walked up to her and I was so, I told her how happy I was to see her use the ATM. You know, and she turned around to me and said, young man, I was younger then, um, you know, you made my day. So, you know, that, that in itself, that experience showing where the old can really adapt to technology because it's more convenient. You know, they don't have to spend 30 minutes lining up, et cetera. So, you know, really, it's, it's, I should also take the opportunity to add that, again, something that, that Chan or maybe Umar had mentioned. You know, our society today has been, let me use the word lightly, spoiled in the sense that the whole banking sector facilitated cash. And the cost of that facilitation was never borne, so to speak, by anybody but the bank. So when you saw the banks migrating and pushing people, if you could call it that, out of the branches, using whether it's the ATM or online banking, and of course some people now have apps and so on, it, it really was because as a consumer to transact cash, it didn't cost you anything. I mean, it cost you other than to withdraw, if, but if you had an arrangement where you could withdraw for free, you know, so it's a, it's a cost that is now beginning to be highlighted. Um, and I think that the consumer must begin to be more aware of it. And of course, there's the whole complication of inclusion that Omar mentioned also, because sometimes we have to make banking, financial services more affordable. You know, so, so I, I know I went on a little bit, Uri, but you know me, that's how it is. No, I think that... Um young boy, young boy's advice and, and perspective uh, over the years definitely share, shows us that this is not new and that people don't have to be as afraid as they are sometimes. But we understand that fear. And I think, Omar, now might be an interesting, someone is asking, and I'll, I'll bring it into a wider question. They're asking about how quickly banks are moving uh, to help overcome and, and these issues and, and implement fintech. Uh, and as you heard from Chairman, it's not a new thing. They've been doing it for years. And they are encouraging people to use more online and fintech applications. But what from your interaction with financial institutions over the last few months in particular, especially with COVID, I think you can share with our attendees that there has been some uptake, right? And they, and they are moving and and different financial institutions are looking at it differently. What would you like to, to say to that question about how quickly different stakeholders are move, getting on board? Sure, sure no, thanks. And, you know, I, I go back to you know, what we've heard a number of times. It's, it's you know, disrupt or be disrupted, right? And you, what you are seeing now is, within our local uh, economy here, is that you see some institutions that are partnered with local fintechs. To, to add new value, added services. Some are trying to build it in-house. Like, like the Richard Chairman has mentioned, for a number of years with a push to become more digital and, and allowing less interaction within the branches and more online through or on your mobile. So what you see is that there has been adoption and you know, there are certain things that have to be in place to allow for the adoption to take place. Infrastructure is one which you have seen 
that has been developed here in Toronto and Tobago. So we do have the infrastructure in place and the other is regulation and legislation, which will allow for it to actually be rolled out. You know, I, I can say uh, from my interaction with these institutions that they have products and services ready to be pushed out. It's now being, having everything else around it to allow for it. And one, yes, I said infrastructure, two is legislation, and third is also what we just mentioned is cultural change and consumer, consumers' willingness to take it on. And if it's not on the financial institution side, you will find that it's also from the public sector side that new initiatives have been pushed out, which the banks will then also and institutions be, have to allow to have to be able to facilitate. And one idea of this, one example, sorry, of this is court pay, for instance. You know, it's these types of initiatives that it might be small scale in, in, in the beginning, but have the potential to go into a lot of other areas that provide other services. You know, you would see the U-turn services out of the license our Ministry of Transport and Works. You know, it's only a matter of time till that becomes much more online and, and available to, to consumers. So, right, to answer the question broadly, yes, there is adoption happening within the financial institutions, not just banks, but insurance companies as well. You know, it's, it's a matter of time till you see a lot more options being online, just like you can do outside of Toronto Bay, where you can shop online for insurance and do comparisons. You know, they have local uh, fintechs that are looking at these options that might actually already be doing it. So for the larger institutions, it's only, as I mentioned, back to my first point, it's, it's to either disrupt or be disrupted. So it's only a matter of time till they, they start pushing out these products and services. Thank you for that. I, and, and that's a, a very important point, I think, to, to remain competitive and especially in alignment with the younger generation's demands. Some of the persons who are younger than we are, they have been, you know, they've been born into a world where they see a completely digitalized life. And to have to line up in a bank or to sign a, a, a hard copy form to them might be, you know, really backward to use that word deliberately. But Chan, I know that we're going to put you on the spot here a bit because sometimes there is demand in the market and people are asking for new options and, and technology to be implemented and they're willing to use it for the most part and that will drive, of course, other adoption. But coming from a regulatory background yourself, with that demand and that expectation, sometimes the regulators seem to get the short end of the stick. You know, people take a lot of the of their frustration out on them and say, well, maybe they're not moving as quickly as they should. Let's let's help our regulatory friends a bit by explaining. I, I would ask you to explain to, to our audience what is what is the mindset of a regulator in, in, in a dynamic environment like this? And, and at the end of the day, what are they trying to do? And to, of course, on their behalf, from your engagement with them and being there, explain, ex also endorse the fact that they are behind this as well. Thank you, Uri. Very good question. Um, I wish the entire nation was listening to this part of it so they can get a sense of where we are. But the thing is that regulators look at systemic risk. So that while as a consumer or as a business person or as an individual, we would look at one perspective, the regulator looks at all of those perspectives, including that of the country, and then what is best for the country moving forward, taking, putting all the different parts together. Which is why regulations and you know, legislations and so on take some time. So it's not something that is done willy-nilly or overnight. It actually takes a lot of research, it takes a lot of discussion um, with various stakeholders, drafting process and of course, public commentary. But the thing is that, you know, because systemic risk is what is being looked at, especially when you're speaking about the financial sector, systemic risk, investor protection, all of these things, it is critical that the regulators take the right steps moving forward. In some instances, you just have one chance to get this thing right. It's better you get it in such a way that it is a bit restrictive and then you can ease, ease it up a bit rather than getting it wrong in the first place and then there's some huge follow that then has a huge economic impact on the country. So for example, if you do you know, bring that into our discussion now, specific, specifically with FinTech, you realize that there's no legislation per se with respect to financial technology. However, there's an e-money policy. The e-money policy is, a right, is, a, is, an, is an easier right to passage. It's a policy, so it doesn't, it doesn't require the rigor that legislation requires 
However, what it does provide is uh, an avenue that allows innovation, allows flexibility and dynamism, and at the same time, it allows the regulators to have a level of oversight that one, allows the innovation, but at the same time protects the investor, protects the business, protects the country. And so the e-money policy does that. And to expand that discussion a bit, what is central bank is doing based upon, you know, all of the discussion that's happening in the public, the e-money policy and e-money order is one thing. They would have also um, created with the, the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Financial Intelligence Unit, the Innovation Hub. And that is where persons and all fintech operators or potential operators can go on to to then get all the information that they need, registration forms, the guidelines to, to regulate them and so on, to then be able to know whether they can operate or not. In addition to which, the regulator understanding that this is new, it is new to the country, we are all feeling our way through this given its newness, they would have also developed a regulatory sandbox. And what this really is, is that for these new products that are unique, we may not be too aware of, or persons who want to operate but not quite ready, they are placed in this sandbox, so this, this space of which they are monitored, they operate with a segment of the market, but not the entire market, to see how they operate and then get them ready to go out into the marketplace. So when you take all of these things together, um, that too will take some time. But like I said, it's really an easier rise of passage to get to where you need to be. But ultimately, when a regulator does what it does, it really is in relation to protection, systemic risk, and of course, ensuring that you know, any action, a course of action that's taken, the, you know, doesn't result in any detrimental impact on the country. Um, you know, sorry, go ahead. I, could just say, I just, I just want to, I just, let, let's just answer the, the, the sort of, I'm looking at the questions and I'm, I'm sensing that there is a concern as to whether the country, whether it will ever happen. Yes. Yeah. You know, I think, I think, Certainly, as a, as, a, as a mature person, I think, you know, when you think back, change sometimes takes long. But my feeling is that you have a couple of drivers now. You have the, the financial institutions recognizing, basically, to remain in cash is costing them money. So they want to evolve processes, products, services that will minimize the use of cash. I mean, the ATMs and the plastics and all that, that, that is kind of passe now, right? I mean, many banks now you could pay online, transfer to each other. So they are driven by that. And in fact, in one bank, you see where the CEO comes on, on television, and, and virtually talk about using their, their online services and avoid coming to the bank. So there's certainly that move, that push, obviously fueled by COVID, much more than in the past. You mentioned it, Rudy. The, the, the future market are people like most of the participants on this webinar. And it is for you, whether you are the consumer or as an SME or even as a full-fledged business, you must push for that because there are a lot of benefits, even for you to process the cash. You know, I remember having a, a customer who was a major and still is a major fast food business. And the kind of cash they got and then dumped it in the bank, it was a big issue. You know, and it's public that between ourselves as citizens, um, Scotia, and I say we, but Scotia banked the lottery board at one time, mainly. You know, and all that cash would come in. So, that, you know, it's beginning to happen. And then, of course, you have the, the underlay now where the government has now said that they now want to transform the country, transform the economy by going digital. So I think that that change is going to be more rapid. And it is for all of us collectively to point out the benefits of change, to facilitate it, to encourage it. I mean, there are lots of other technical questions which, which I'm happy to, that we could answer. I don't have to get all the time, but I wanted to make that point that I think it's not going to take as long. There is all the ingredients there now. And the biggest one, of course, is the, is the consumer, the customer. The customer say, I want it. If you don't want it, I'm going to go to another bank who can offer it. And we also believe that the e-money order is bringing in another group of players who, at least on the payment side, would be competing somewhat to the traditional commercial bank. So it gives an opportunity. It brings about entrepreneurship, etc. But of course, we have to be guided 
by regulations at the same time. I mean, you see if you are stopping La Hoqueta yesterday, I mean, you don't want that kind of thing to happen also. Okay, but really, I mean, there are lots of questions here. I don't know how we intend to deal with it. Do we have it all captured so that we could get back to the people? Yes. Like, so, uh, yeah. but there's one I would like, you know, between Chan and Omar to answer, where there was a question, how can the TTISC and FinTech help? I think it was, you know, towards entrepreneurs or something. But that's scanning the question. Omar? Um, you well, I'll jump in first and, and Chan, if you want to add uh, uh, anything afterwards, but really, the, the role of the Trinidad Typical IFC is to, to be your ally, to re, be your resourceful ally. That's our slogan, and to facilitate, um, to aid where we can in terms of bringing some of the answers to the questions that you may have before you even bring a, a product or service to market. And really, you know, we've been in discussions with the regulators. And, you know, to kind of give you a bit more information, you know, the e-money order policy is out. You will see some communications in the upcoming weeks uh, from the regulators and from ourselves explaining you know, some of the processes in, in acquiring perhaps uh, one of these licenses to operate as a payment facilitator. But really what it is is the IFC, even through the FinTech TT Association, through our um, discussions with the regulators, really has an area where we could be a type of an innovation type of hub for you. So we can help you prepare for the applications uh, for the e-money um, license or anything that may be uh, a regulatory application that you may have. The central bank will ha have their own regulatory hub where they will also walk you through that process. You know, these are some things that, you know, I don't want to speak, you know, out of turn, but they have these uh, plan, plan initiatives coming up where things can be done online. A lot of the answers for the application process will be provided online to, to speed up the efficiency of responses. There will be timing for when you can get your answers. But we will also work on your behalf to get some of those answers, not obviously more general answers, not specific to your applications, because those will always be maintained confidentially, maintain confidentiality with the, with the regulators. But that's really our role. Now, on another side of that, we offer you know, incentives to, to FinTech players. You know, we have an incubation hub. You know, we will review your, your business proposal and say, look, this is an entity that will help create jobs, diversify the economy, generate foreign exchange. These are some of the mandates for the Trinidad Tobago IFC specifically. And in that role, we can help facilitate and accommodate um, different types of investors and startups in that aspect. And it's something that will obviously start with a discussion and meeting, understanding your business idea, your business proposal. And once it fits in with our mandate um, and development of the financial sector, it's something that we'll definitely take a look at and see how best we can help you along the way. Um, and another, I know I see some of these other questions in terms of financing and, and venture capital and, and how do we, you know, help out in that area. The IFC wouldn't um, directly invest in these companies, but our goal, uh, again, is to facilitate and bring you together with persons who might have seed funding or uh, any type of funding that may help in, in, in bringing your, your idea to life. So that's where we would come in. So I just wanted to clarify that because I know sometimes a lot of persons have questions of, well, is the Trinantivic IFC willing to invest in these opportunities? And you know that's just not our role um, to date. It's really to be the facilitator. Thank you, Omar. And as Chairman alluded to, we will trap all of these questions and send answers out to all of you who registered. Because as you can tell, it's a very complex, it's a complex situation, and you really can't unpack it completely in an hour. But we're happy to get the questions because this is the point of the webinar. It's a fine of a forum in these times where we can engage with you, our stakeholders, and to get your, your issues out so that we can start defining better, uh, a better process in terms of bringing people on board. So I'm, I mean, we're touching as we go along on some of the issues that are being raised. Um, for example, the issue of legislation and the, 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 the whether it's moving as quickly as possible. We've answered some of the questions about whether banks are moving as fast as they should. And I think the point should be noted, of course, as, as Omar has intimated, a lot of the opportunity now are for innovators, right? We, the banks have their role to play, but I think, what do you all believe is the, it really is the role of the private sector and entrepreneurs and, and, and MSMEs to come forward more and and utilize some of the, the incentives that will be that have been earmarked to create solutions for us. And how, how does that, I mean, Chan, I know you've been talking to some stakeholders in the last few weeks. 
do you want to sh start off the, um, the, the last bit of the conversation about that, a call to action, if you will, then? Well, I mean, certainly the time is now that changes here. Um, we do have the e-money policy up and running. Um, we're up. Um, very soon, the central bank, um, along with the other regulators, will be doing a launch, um, as mentioned by a CEO. And once that occurs and that, that space now opens up, it really is for you know, persons who are interested in participating in that space, your fintech operators, your startup companies, to really come forward and participate in that. Um, again, uh, just to, to add on to a bit to what Umar said, and of course to speak to what Rudy is saying, you know, the fintech TT, which is the, the association setup for fintechs, that is operational, that is up and running right now. And of course, it really is incumbent upon any interested party who wants to participate in that space, in the fintech space, to reach out to, the fin to, reach out to fintech TT, get yourself registered, acquainted with them, so that that assistance can also be provided from, on that forum. From the IFC standpoint, as, as um, Omar intimated, we, we do have, and um, we are looking at the, the innovation hub. But outside of that, there are external parties and external organizations who are also operating and trying to push the fintech space for example, there's a CAF, the Latin American Development Bank. They're doing a hackathon very soon. And it's really allowing, and it's up and down the Caribbean, it's regional wide, um, 11 Caribbean countries. And Trinidad and Tobago is one of the participant, one of the participating countries. All the information on that will be available very soon. But what that is doing is that it's allowing startup companies and fintech operators locally to be able to participate in that competition. And should you be successful, you'd be put into an accelerator program for a three month period. And at the end of it, the intention and the hope is that you will then be able or be ready for market to then be able to participate, not just locally, but you'd also actually have a Caribbean reach having participated in a Caribbean, uh, Caribbean hackathon or Caribbean competition. So all of the avenues are there and all of the pieces are there. It's really about pulling them all together now. And the IFC is, is playing a critical role in bringing all of those things together to ensure that that information is there to be able to assist you in as seamless as possible transition into the fintech space. Rudy, I just wanted to just make one more comment on uh, Ronald Phillips' um, question about whether the local banks offer an e-commerce banking solution, etc. I want to tell you, my experience was that when I always felt that offering the e-money payment, in other words, somebody wanted to sell a product online, and you know, we had a, a kind of a solution. We use a company offshore, I think it's called First Atlantic, to do all the processing of the payment. There are now more and more solutions being offered to potentially not bypass, but, but make it easier. So, so that I think that that barrier is going to be removed sooner or later. You know, and then I also feel that, that, you know, the recovery committee, as one of the phases, talks about reigniting economic activity. Um, and I think, again, once the entrepreneurs come forward, and this is where we want to kind of collaborate with private and public sector to make the point that, that, that businesses need this, right? So that there will be that trust. And as I said, one bank is already pushing it a lot on the consumer side. But, you know, we also have to understand sometimes the reality is that if you don't get critical mass, the investment that is required becomes more critical. Right, um, but I think with digital, you know, you could probably, it's easier to get your unit cost down, so to speak. So that I, I feel very optimistic that I think the stars, if you want to call it, are now getting aligned. And deeper than that, I think the policy makers understand that as a country, if we get digit, digitally divided against the rest of the world, it is a form of poverty. So I think that the whole declaration of digital transformation and, and the country moving towards digital, the government services, the demand for it, um, I think there's a much more, a greater impetus to push it. But as Chan says, there are detractors. We're not naive. There are detractors who want to maintain status quo because they benefit, benefit by it. And they don't want the change. So we have as a country, as a people, we have to push towards it. Again, Chan outlined some of the positives, you know, the transparency. I think even Omar talked about the security aspect. There are lots of balancing, eh? 
you know, we take for granted people in this group, I guess, wouldn't be concerned our privacy. But there are detractors who will use privacy as an, uh, you know, as a reason not to move forward. So, you know, it really is, um, it's a nice task, it's a nice challenge, uh, but we have to move forward. You know, the fourth generation or the fourth revolution is here with us. And if we don't move forward, we're going to find ourselves in a country even deeper divided. I, I think I just want to point out that our next webinar, which is called for October 7th, will actually have the regulators in the hot seat with Chan. And we're going to be delving deeper into the regulatory environment. So some of the questions that our audience has asked today, our audience members have asked, I'm, I believe will be answered in more detail at that time. But I, I gather, I hope that people are leaving with the fact that we, we anticipated these questions and we understand the complexity and, and it is a work in process, but things are moving. It, Omar Adana is asking if we can expand on the role of data science and what, sure. what data science has to play, what role it has to play uh, in policy and, and development. And I, I know you would like to talk to that because of something we did recently. So, so uh, and, and I'm watching the time, but I, I just I wanted to address that as well because another aspect of the IFC here is, you know, take on initiatives where we can upscale our local talent, um, not just to attract foreign investors, but also to develop our local market as, as best as we can because we know we have the talent right here in Trinidad and Tobago. And we always try to, you know, we talk about the brain drain and, and, and persons leaving and doing work outside of Trinidad. And now in today's day and age, they can still be based here, but working for the Googles and the Facebooks and, and, and these big firms outside of Trinidad. So with, when it comes to data analytics and data science, we have taken on uh, teaming up a number of different MOUs with local uh, providers of these services, um, upskilling uh, ta uh, talent within the public and private sectors. We've had a number of workshops um, using different um, platforms. The latest ones have been Tableau and Data Robot. But really, why, why are we doing that is exactly to, to the point that she's raising, is that it all interlocks, it all builds upon each other, that you need the talent here to build the fintech solutions, and we have it right here. The, the financial institutions can look at their data. We sit on so much data here in Trinidad and Tobago that if we just start using a little bit by a little bit each time, we can come up with great solutions um, for, the, for the consumer. So yes, data analytics and data science, it's going to be something that we're going to push um, tremendously over the next year. Um, we, you will see a lot of things coming out from the Trinidad and Tobago IFC in the next couple of weeks um, and to some surveys that we're going to be sending out to, to institutions and then offering some type of you know, cons free consultancy with some partners uh, with the end goal of doing a, a pilot project to see what type of products and services we can bring about improvements in through data analytics and data science. And I know as we're wrapping up, I just wanted to mention two other things. You mentioned the fourth webinar, where I see a lot of questions on the e-money policy. I'm not saying that's going to be the primary, the, the only topic on the, the fourth webinar, but you know, I, I think our regulators don't ask the hot topic right now, so they will come prepared to answer some of the questions that you have there, um, because we know we can't capture all of, of what we're trying to do in one hour. And then the other um, item is that utilize FinTech CT as, as much as you can, as well as the IRC, but the questions that you have, you know, as Chris is asking about if they have expertise in this area, where can they go uh, to share some of their ideas, use, use the avenues that we're, we're trying to lay out there, because this is where the private sector's role comes in to play, is that we can put, provide the foundation, but unless they drive it, um, we will not get the solutions in place. So please reach out. Um, we'll try to answer all the questions as really mentioned. But you know, the takeaway is understand that there is an outlet that you can use. Uh, and, if, and if it's not the Trinidad and Tobago IFC, we will find the correct outlet for you um, to, to get your ideas and, and your voice heard. So um, you know, I just wanted to kind of give that as one of my last uh, comments before we wrap up, Rudy. So it is 10 past four on my clock. And I'm sure our attendees will allow us a few extra minutes given our electrical difficulties earlier. But as we go around the table, uh, I'd like to start with our chairman and move to Omar and then Chan. Is this the end of cash in Trinidad and Tobago? Uh, people, you see some sentiments around that fair. Uh, and if it isn't, where do you see the balance? And 
in explaining that balance, I guess I'm asking you, what is your vision really for a fintech-enabled cashless Trinidad and Tobago? Chairman? Rudy, that's a real hard one. I really used to ask so, such difficult questions. You know, I, I think I look at it very optimistically. There are going to be challenges, as, as China pointed out. Um, cash will always be there. But, you know, I think there are a lot of drivers, as I said earlier, that are now reinforcing and bringing home that the transaction cash is costly. It's also risky, right? Uh, I mean, just even the cash, the printing of those polymer notes must have costed the country, the central bank, plenty money. Now, if you didn't have to print as many, could you imagine, right? Um, so I think the, 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 the stars are aligning. And I think that we are, it's going to take time, but I believe that the, the speed of it, the speed of change is going to be faster than it has been in my days of ATMs and online banking. I, I think that um, it, it's coming. And once the, the, the whole push is there by the government, by the recovery committee, um, I think there's an opportunity for us, as I said, not just to go cashless, but to create some new industries, as Omar said, to create new jobs as, as we journey into this fintech space. So I am optimistic, even at my old age. At your young age. At, your at my young, young age. <laughs> Charlie, you, sorry, Omar, you heard what Chairman had to say. Sorry, and just to add, you know, I, I, I see these comments and questions sometimes come about as well, you know, you know, I mean, we're not going to have any more cash, right? You know, that, you know, they don't want that. But, you know, I'm, I'm very literal, right? We're not seeing a cash-free society. If you look at the team, it's really a, a cash-less. So just less, think of it as less reliance on it, less usage of it, but still having it as an option. I think if you look at it from that standpoint, it will alleviate a lot of the fears, right? Because there's certain things, yes, you know, you may still want to use your cash for the transact, and you're not saying, you know, it's, it's, you're not allowed to, but we have to give you as many options as possible because there are, there are many different types of persons in our society in different generations. And, you know, we, we speak about the millennials and the generations that come after them. You know, some of them may never even use checks. We don't even know, know what a check is, perhaps, because, you know, they just wouldn't have any need for it. Um, so and that might be how cash might be in the future. But as of right now, in the present, in the, in the next few years, I think it all, you know, pushes us in the right direction. And I think this experience that we're still in, this COVID experience, it shows you know, the need for it, the digital transformation. And, and if we had certain things in place, maybe other things could have more, run more efficiently. But that being said, we're taking the opportunity now to push these cashless initiatives. So I think look at it in that too, not cash-free, but a cash-less society. And I think that will help alleviate a lot of the fears as well. I think you just gave me an idea for one of our campaign slogans <laughs> so chan over to you your vision cashless yeah. cash free oh well chairman and omar are very little for me to say <laughs> but you know just to add a little statistic to um what is being said there's no country in the world that is completely cashless um the closest to that i believe is sweden um and you know they will get to that maybe in 2025 and it's not government driven either it's business driven 2% of businesses in, in Sweden uses, accepts cash still. And that is driven by the private sector. That is not driven by the government or anyone else. So even if they do get to 100%, it will not eliminate cash. The option will still be there should there be a desire to use cash. You know, but my, my vision is that you know, when you look at cashless, when you look at what we're doing here, you know, this is, it's, it's historic, what is happening here now. And if it succeeds, you know, the possibilities are infinite. You know, it's not just about the operator of the fintech. It's all of the supporting um, developers and companies that support that fintech operator as well. That becomes important. So that, you, you know, from a commerce standpoint, from a business standpoint, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you know, it's, it, it's immense, the possibilities and the, 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 the potential for growth, for development. I would like to see Trinidad and Tobago on the international stage when it comes to financial technology. You might sit and say that's impossible and that's, you know, it's not something that can happen. But we have banks that operate on a global stage. We have athletes that operate on a global stage. You know, we have so many global 
elements of Trinidad and Tobago, why not FinTech? It may not happen today, it may not happen tomorrow, it may not happen next year, it may happen in five years, it may happen in 10 years, but the possibility is also there. It really is up to us to be able to do that. That is my vision for it. And lastly, my vision is to be able to sit in my room, put up, feet up, order something to eat, and be able to have multiple options to pay, including cash, to get my stuff. The only thing I may not get out of this is a robot who will collect it at the door for me. <laughs> well, you never know one day. You never know. I tell you. you. <laughs> All so, right. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for sharing your insights and for answering some of these hot questions uh, that have been posed to us. And, and, and rightfully so. I think that uh, we, we have been able to provide some information and, and whet the appetite, if you will. So my hope is that our audience members will continue to log on and, and stay tuned in to the TNT IFC's various social media pages, as well as our upcoming communications. You know, as we look forward to celebrating together Republic Day tomorrow, just, and, and actually just a little bit of trivia on that, because sometimes people ask, we actually became a republic on August 1st, 1976. The reason we celebrate on the 24th of September is because that was the first Republican Parliament session that was held. So you can share that with some of the younger folk who may not be aware. <laughs> but it, as we reflect on that, uh, think about how far we have actually come in 44 years, uh, which we've, we have achieved a lot together. Um, and we still have more to aspire to, yes, but when compared to other countries that have been independent for far longer than we have been, I think that Trinidad Tobago, as chairman, started by saying uh, in, his, in his introductory remarks, we have a fantastic foundation to work with. Our financial services sector is robust. It has weathered certain storms, uh, again, where, where others have not. Uh, as Omar mentioned the TNT IFC is doing a lot of the groundwork behind the scenes. We have been keeping a pulse on global changes and trends and advising the Ministry of Finance, our line minister and the government by extension. Uh, we've developed a roadmap and Chan expressed the sentiments held by all stakeholders. We, we want to see this move forward. This, the regulators are on board, but they are, they are doing their job, which is to be circumspect and to ensure that the end user is protected. And he has made a call, as, as our other panelists have, for the private sector and you, the end user, to really get involved in this process. So as we celebrate tomorrow's holiday, uh, we at the TNT IFC want to thank you for taking the time this afternoon to listen to us, to ask your questions, and we ask you to while celebrating, remain safe, but reflect upon your part and your role in moving Trinidad and Tobago further along the chain of becoming a fintech-enabled financial services hub and one day a cash-less, perhaps not cash-free, but cash-less society. So thank you very much. Uh, visit our website, ttifc.co.tt or the fintech TT's website at fintechtt.com and stay tuned to, on our social media platform for more updates on this and other upcoming initiatives. Thank you very much. Stay safe. And thank you to our panelists for your time as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Okay. All the best, everyone. Stay safe. Bye. Take care.